I'm going to read a little excerpt from Girl, Wash Your Face as per the request about Howler Monkeys. So if you're not familiar with Girl, Wash Your Face, this is published in 2017, I believe. This is the book that has sold millions and millions of copies. Uh, it launched Rachel Hollis into the Ethernet. Um, okay, number so no, chapter seven, The Lie, I'm Bad at Sex. On page 73. Okay, here we go, everybody. Get ready. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll read you a little bit, and then I'll get to the Howard the Monkey part. Okay, she says, I used to be really bad at sex. Whoa, Nelly, you didn't think I was going there, but I totally am. I'm going to talk about sex as a married Christian woman, and I hope it'll be okay. My husband, he's likely hiding under a rock right now because me writing about this is definitely his worst nightmare. My worst nightmare is getting chased by Bigfoot, so I guess we all have our crosses to bear, Dave. But Dave shouldn't be worried. I'm not writing about him. I'm writing about me and my bad sex. I'm choosing to write about this big, scary, embarrassing thing at the risk of petrifying my in-laws and giving me ma a heart attack because I think it's important. I don't think women talk about it enough. This is also the same woman who recently said that a woman was watching, or I guess a person, she didn't say the gender, a, the per, a person was watching a movie on their own screen on a plane that had a sex scene in it and she was m completely offended. So I guess she's gone back. Okay. Uh, all right. This is, this page has the Howler monkey part in it. Um, let's see. Are we all enjoying this? Thank you. <laughs> no one said anything. I'm just assuming that everyone's like, yeah, totally. Keep going. Okay. Um, uh, Oh, sure, the world talks about it as much as it can, as loud as it can, as often as it can, but not in a realistic way, not in a way that makes tangible sense to a virginal clarinet player whose experience with men when she met her husband was equal to her experience with hunting large game in Africa, which is to say none, none at all. My early opportunities for sexual education included ladies at church who didn't speak about it within my hearing or media as a whole, which showed me an ideal that was impossible to achieve. So I walked into my marriage with no realistic idea of what to expect, which is flipping ridiculous. Uh, I wish, okay, wait a little. I wish just one time before I got married, someone had said, look, here are my experiences. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you should consider. And also, the fir and also, the first few times you have sex, you should pee afterwards so you don't get a UTI. Okay, let me just cut it right there. Any ladies out there, don't stop at a, first, a few first times. Do it every time. <laughs> every lady should pee after having sex. Key is tip number one for life. Key is tip number two for life. Number one, gulp your water 10 times if you want to feel disgusting. <laughs> while drinking water and two pee every single time you have sex the first few times ain't gonna cut it you still might get a uti okay somewhere in texas an older reader just fainted yes i wrote about a urinary tract infection if that freaks you out move right along to the next chapter sister because it's gonna get way more intimate than that <laughs> i knew very little about sex other than what I had gleaned from TV or movies. So I was terrible at it. And not terrible as in awkward, though I am most definitely that. It was terrible because I was miserable. And I made my husband miserable too. Five years into our marriage, our sex life was nearly non-existent. By comparison, we'll celebrate our 14th wedding anniversary this year. And now our sex life is the stuff of legends. Yes, that's what it says. I swear to God, I can't really see it, but... Eh? Anyways. No, seriously, we do it more. Okay, here, okay. here's the part that everyone wants to hear, right? This is the juicy part that needs to live, in, live on in infamy forever. No, seriously, we do it more than any married couple you know, or, let, or at least more often than most married couples with four kids and two full-time jobs. We have sex not out of obligation, but because it's really, really good. 
When it's really good, why would you not go at it like a couple of... Okay, sorry. Why would you not go at it like a couple of howler monkeys whenever you can? (sighs) Okay, and then she says, Today it's awesome, but it was a long road from there to here, and I'm going to tell you about it in case you find yourself in the same place and because I don't want you to get a UTI. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, we can skip. I mean, I'll just read it. I just highlighted certain parts that are like the juiciest. So I met Dave when I was 19 years old and he was 27. I had never been on a date before and he didn't know how much younger I was than him. As I've already told you, when the truth came out a couple of months in, it went over like an, okay, here's, here's a good one. Here's a good line. All right. As I've already told you, when the truth came out a couple months in, it went over like an obese cat falling off the back fence. It was an ungraceful and violent fall, but we still landed on our feet. So she didn't tell him that she was 19. She knew he was 27, but apparently it came out. It went over like an obese cat falling off a fence. Uh, Dave has been my best friend since that first year together. He is my favorite human on the planet, and I love him so much, it makes my heart want to explode. (laughs) Eek, what happened? When we got married, and again, this was written in 2017. This is not like 1995. When we got married, we had the happiest life I could have possibly dreamed up for myself. And for sex, we did it like rabbits. We did it like rabbits because that's what you're supposed to do as newlyweds, right? How many times could we do it in a day? How many times in an hour? I would do it in the rain, in the dark, on a train, in a car, in a tree. You get the point, Sam I am. We were having lots of sex and I loved it. I loved it because being physically close with him made me feel cherished and adored. I loved it because it made him so happy. It made us so happy. We were newlyweds. We were having sex and life was good. But as the first couple of years went on, and the newness wore off, the joy of the honeymoon phase wore off too. In the beginning, my excitement made me bold. As time went on, though, I felt less comfortable as if a switch had been flipped. I was raised to be a good Christian girl. Now I was supposed to be a sex kitten, but I had no idea how. So I drank. This is another part that I sort of have a problem with because she doesn't really ever fix it. Uh... We go on a date night. I have just enough wine to feel sexy. Then I try to do sexy things or act in a sexy way, but I rarely enjoyed it as much as he did. Did I pretend to enjoy it? Heck yes. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Then I started to resent the fact that I wasn't wasn't enjoying it, resented that I thought I should have sex even when I wasn't that excited about it. Then I had a baby and my body morphed and my stomach stretched out and my boobs leaked and I was exhausted. Sex was basically the least enjoyable thing I could imagine, but I kept doing it, kept pretending that I loved every second. I never once talked to Dave about how I was feeling. That I highlighted that part. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's not healthy advice. I mean, I know she's saying she fixed it, but like she blamed Dave quite a bit for all of their issues, marital issues. And if he doesn't know, you can't blame him for not knowing. He's not gonna read your mind. Oh, thank you, Stella Black. Stella you picked a pear character sliding on the floor on his knees saying goal. <laughs> Which part? The howler monkey part? Um, here's, here's the perfect sound bite for this moment. I will actually do something obscene for you. It's- giving me life um are we all enjoying this reading moment by the way (laughs) because i'm enjoying it actually um and just remember i mean it's not really a uterus that's in fact affected by this uh uti but you know just in case rachel says my uterus needs to be flushed (laughs) i i gotta agree i gotta agree Bed, Betty Davis, Bet Davis. Um, I would be mortified as well. This is a lot of information. And yes, like she, she hates her mother-in-law, you know, Dave's mom, which I'm, you know, I don't, I was gonna say, I'm sure she has a right to, who knows? Maybe she's a perfectly fine person. Um, but from experience, like sometimes mother-in-laws can be a pain in the ass. Uh, but yeah, like you read your, your daughter-in-law's book and this information is included, like, yeah, that would not make me happy. Uh, 
again, like, yes, I also see these comments too are like, you know, it's cool to talk about sex and like be empowered and all this stuff, but it just, there's a certain, I don't know. It's like almost like, yeah, blame him, blame everyone else. Like I just drank to fix it. Like, where's the, the end? Like, where's the resolution? Like I went to a, of group therapy and I fixed it. Like, I don't know. I just sort of like, I, the, here's my stumblings of sex. And now we fuck up. <laughs> now we bang all the time. <laughs> like, I don't, what, what changed? I don't know. It's just like, well, we, we decided that we were now going to have good sex. Okay. Anyways, let me go back. Uh, okay. I, and I don't like that. She doesn't talk to Dave and that she finds that to be heroic in some way, at least how it comes off to me that she's excited or, or she thought that she did the right thing by not like give him a chance to be an asshole, you know, or give him a chance to be a good guy. But if you don't tell him, you'll never be able to see what type of person he is. And that's, I think a control thing, but okay. Um, okay. I never once talked to Dave about how I was feeling. I was too embarrassed and unsure. I was also nervous about hurting his feelings. So I kept it to myself. More time passed and our sex life was hanging by a thread. By the time our second son was a toddler, sex barely happened at all. And when I came out of the fog of being a mother of two and thought enough to ask Dave about it, the answer was hard to hear. Quote, why don't we have sex anymore? I asked him one night. He looked at me as though the question hurt his feelings. I got tired of being shot down. I was immediately defensive. I don't shoot you down. I always say yes. Okay. Quote, you might agree, Rachel, but you don't actually want to. And that's worse than not having it at all. Initially, I was pretty annoyed. Here, I was taking one for the team, and he was hurt because I wasn't more enthusiastic. But the more I thought about it, the more I understood how right he was. I might have been agreeing to sex, but I was stiff and uncomfortable, tired and unenthusiastic. Agreeing to do it did not mean I was embracing it. My husband could tell I wasn't enjoying it. So rather than asking me to participate halfway, he had just stopped asking altogether. What a bummer. Now I will say that's sort of Dave's fault. He also needs to open up to her and say, you know, I'm unhappy because I feel like you're not interested and they can work on it together as opposed to both silently hating each other. I think that honestly was probably their downfall that they didn't talk enough. They didn't express their emotions to each other enough because they were both trying to keep this facade of like perfection at all times to them not even just to the world, to themselves and in, to each other, I think, which would kind of track as to why he was so shocked that, you know, she wasn't happy and she's like never telling him anything. Anyways. Okay. They say the first step to fixing something is admitting you have a problem. Now I know many of you are, in, are super in touch with your own feminine mystique. You've got the whole sex thing down pat and you have a hundred orgasms a week. Okay. I guess that's where she is now because she says she has multiple orgasms with Kez on a daily basis. Good for you, sister. Seriously, you're my hero. And the following advice probably isn't for you. For you, what I have to say will sound trite and basic or maybe even naive. That's cool because these are the things that worked for me and I share them in case they are helpful to someone who is like me or who I used to be. Here are the, st okay, here's the, <laughs> here's my second favorite line of this chapter. Here are the steps I took to go from being bad at sex to being exceptional at sex. <laughs> Rachel, please tell me what you did. I will actually do something obscene for you. Exceptional at sex. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Things that helped her. And it says things that helped me. Um, I redefined sex in my own mind. For the longest time, sex symbolized a lot of things, and not all of them were positive. I decided to change what I thought sex was. This might not be what sex is for you, your friends, or the Holy Ghost, and all the saints, but going forward, I decided that sex was supposed to be a fun experience that would always be more compelling than whatever else I could be doing. Up until that point, I was continuously weighing sex against other things, reading a book, watching TV, etc., and it was playing second fiddle. But if I reminded myself that sex was always an awesome opportunity, then I would presumably want to choose it. Okay. So, all right. Fine. Uh, I, okay. Number two, I figured out how sex could be an earth shattering experience. Now, if you hear her talk, she said that sex was bad and it's only been earth shattering since she's been with her new boyfriend. So 
Okay, whatever. When you're uncomfortable or don't feel sexy or are nervous or shy or whatever, you're not going to enjoy yourself. If you're not enjoying yourself, you're not having good sex. So I asked myself, how can I enjoy this more? What's holding me back? The answer, me. <laughs> Of course. Next, I spoke to Dave about all the things I was thinking and feeling. It shocked me that after all of our years together, I could still be so embarrassed, but I pushed through it. We needed to be on the same page, and the only way to get there was by opening up the book and talking to him about it. Okay, I agree. This is a good one, too. <laughs> I read Hebrews 13.4. Part of my hangups were related to my, my being a good Christian girl who couldn't reconcile becoming a freak in the sheets. And then I read Hebrews 13, 4, 13, 4, quote, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the bed be undefiled. Now, straight up, I'm not sure I'm reading this right. I'm sure someone who studied theology will tell me that this actually means something different. But what I read or what I take away when I read that line is that the things that happen in my bed with my husband cannot be weird or bad or wrong. Let me back up and say there are definitely things that can be that a committed monogamous couple can do sexually that can be incredibly hurtful to them both. <laughs> okay. Now, I agree with her. There are things that can be done Okay, let me, let me just read it again. Uh, she says, there are definitely things that, can, that a committed monogamous couple can do sexually that can be incredibly hurtful to them both. Pornography, for example, is extremely damaging to both the consumer and the people being used as objects for your lust. I don't agree with that. Child version, yes. Adult, no. No. And I don't, I personally have no problem. I know some people differ on this, but I personally have no problem if my boyfriend, my fiance, any born I've ever dated wanted to look at porn while we were together would not bother me at all. If it does bother you, that's okay too. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, you know, I just, I don't think it's like a general statement. Like pornography is damaging for everyone that consumes it or is in it. It's like, no, I don't think so. I, I have no problems, you know? I don't know. And I think people who become porn stars or are in the adult film industry, I would hope a lot of them are choosing to do it for their own reasons and have no problems with it. So, I mean, I think that's like, this is her old, you know, conditioning speaking, but needs a little bit of like an asterisk. Like, you know, in my opinion, this is what I think. Uh, but the other stuff, lingerie, leather, toys, role play, trying every position possible, going at it on the kitchen table, dirty talk, whatever. If it turns you on and doesn't hurt you, I say go for it. Okay. Cool. Uh, I embraced my body. Having a low opinion of your body is so damaging to your ability to enjoy sex. I used to worry about whether or not my tummy was tight or if my butt looked okay in those panties. You know what Dave was thinking when I took off my clothes? Boobies. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> your partner is just thrilled you showed up. And all those things you're questioning aren't helping anyone. I practice positive self-talk about how great my butt looked or how sexy I was. I did it so much that at some point I started to believe it. And this one, I just put a big question mark. Number five. I committed to my orgasm. Okay. I committed to it. All right. Just like I'm going to just, just. Just commit to my goals and persevere. I persevered through my orgasm. We're probably getting taken down off of YouTube. It's like, mm, this is too far. You've gone too far. We're almost done. <clears throat> Uh, okay, just writing that line makes me blush. I'm imagining some future book signing where a reader comes up to my table and says, so you committed to your orgasm? But this is important. And even if it embarrasses me, I want you to know it. Back in the day, when we first started having sex, an orgasm for me was like icing on the cake. But here's the thing, ladies. Orgasms are not icing on the cake. Orgasms are the cake. <laughs> Thanks, Rihanna. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. A second or, okay, so Rachel, you're such a liar. A second orgasm is icing on the cake. Remember how I said that I had to figure out how to make sex the greatest thing ever? Remember how I told you that I wanted to desire it over anything else in my life? You know how to do that? With orgasms. I decided years ago that I would never ever, and I mean never again, have sex that didn't include an orgasm for me. How do you guarantee that? 
please tell me send me a dm <laughs> rachel <laughs> i mean you can like want to but you can't guarantee how what's the guarantee like what's the secret sauce uh, okay. When I told Dave this plan, he agreed it was the greatest idea I'd ever come up with. Because here's the thing. For most of us, our partners are thrilled to give us pleasure. And if we're both committed to my orgasm at the outset, it will happen. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I'm just reading your comments as they come in. Howler monkeys could care less. <laughs> Okay, there's like half a paragraph left. I had to figure out what turns me on. Oh, sure, I'd been turned on many times in my life, but I'd never truly considered the difference between what really did it for me and what was just situational. Knowing what turns me on was key because remember, my orgasms were our new end game. I like how our orgasms were, no, my orgasms were our end game. Like, does he get consideration at all? Or just because he's happy, like he gets no extra attention okay whatever uh okay and i don't know how to have one without being turned on so we experimented until i learned myself and my body better feel free to head back up to the undefiled marriage bed paragraph for a list of ideas which again was lingerie leather toys role play try every position going at it on the kitchen table dirty talk whatever and seven, this is, this is the seven deadly sins of sex. No, I'm just kidding. This is the seven, number seven, but the, in me, the number one indication of incoming divorce because it happened to Heidi and Chris as well. Uh, and someone, I saw someone said it, mentioned it in the comments, but here we go. We committed to having sex every day for a month. Years ago, oh, oh, well, we got to hold on, everybody. Hold on. We got Jour, Jour 565. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're blushing? Yeah, me too. <laughs> and for that, we're going to break the tension just for a second here. Oh, I love that sound. <laughs> and a classic. Why do you follow me if you don't already own my book? This is the best idea you've ever had, Rachel. Thank you, Jour565. Five, five, I was going to say 595. Five. 565, five, I appreciate that very much. And again... Unfollow me. If you don't like reading chapters as your live stream entertainment... Unfollow me. <laughs> okay, back to... Uh, thank you. Back to uh, the number one indication that a couple is about to go through a divorce, in my eyes. Uh, we committed to having sex every day for a month. Years ago, at the outset of changing up our sex lives, Dave and I initiated something we call Sexy September. We vowed to have sex every day during the month of September. <laughs> I made a joke, and maybe this is not funny, but why September? Like, September, for me, when I think of September, it's like, oh, like, Labor Day, right? Is September not the sexiest of holidays? And September 11th. Like, how am I supposed to get sexy on that day? You know, we're supposed to never forget, not like take your clothes off. Anyways, we vowed to have sex every day during the month of September. No excuses. It was pretty daunting in the beginning, especially with full-time jobs and two little kids. But the end result was fantastic. It gave me the opportunity to experiment and try things out with no pressure. Well, except for Dave, because he's got to give you an orgasm every single time or else the marriage is over. That's pressure on him. Why, why does he get to have all the pressure? You don't have any pressure. Also, shockingly, having more sex made us want to have sex more. I highly encourage you to pick your own sexy month and go for it. Yeah, I'm going to pick December because at least Christmas is like sexier than 9-11. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Again, that, I feel like my jokes have gone a little too far today, but, you know, it is Monday. Um, and that, my friends, was Girl, Wash Your Face, an excerpt from The Lie I Tell Myself I'm Bad at Sex. So that should clear up all of the uh, questions <laughs> that have been asked. 